I'm going to talk today about the MetaP package. This package, which is available from CRAN, does the meta analysis of significance values, also known as p values. This is useful if, in fact, you don't have effect sizes. For instance, you have a number of old studies which just report a p value, or the primary studies have reported incompatible tests. If you do have effect sizes, then obviously using them would be preferable. And there are a number of packages on CRAN which enable you to do this. Uh, perhaps the most popular two are Metaphor and Meta. So what methods do we have available in MetaP? Here I show the various methods, the eponym for it in normal um, type, and after it, the uh, name of the function in MetaP in parenthesis. There is a group of methods using some transformation of the p-values. Um, they rely either on the inverse chi-squared distribution, inverse normal distribution, inverse students t, or the inverse logit. And there are also a number of methods which work directly with the p-values, either with uh, the sum or the mean of them, or just using a single selected p-value. I think of these, the most well-known methods are Fisher's method, which relies on the sum of logs, which is in fact an inverse with, with two degrees of freedom and inverse chi-squared, uh, Stouffer's method, and possibly Tippett's method, the minimum P, although that's not um, usually, not often known by that name. So how do you use them? Well, all the functions have as their first parameter a vector of the p-values, and they have some additional parameters. They all return an object of class meta p for which there is a plot method and a function-specific class which supports a print method. The example shows you loading the package, um, extracting the partic a particular data set from the um, collection of data sets provided. It's one uh, set of teacher expectancy ratings. And then using Stufa's method on that, which is sum z. That returns the relevant statistic and also the p-value. As you can see, this rejects the null hypothesis. You'll see the values of p for the teacher expect when we come on to the graphical display section. I said that showed that it was rejecting the null hypothesis. Well, what is the null hypothesis? Well, it's well defined. It's that all of the p values, the pi, have a uniform distribution on the unit interval. However, there are two classes of alternative hypothesis. One, that all of the p sub i have the same unknown, non uniform, non increasing density. And the second, that at least one, possibly more, has an unknown, non-uniform, non-increasing density. If all of the tests being combined come from what are basically replicates, then the first one of these is appropriate. If they're different kinds of test or different conditions, then the second is appropriate. It's also appropriate when you imagine that the signal in the data will only be located in uh, one or two of the primary studies which you are combining. Now, does it make a difference which method you choose? Well, yes, of course it does. Otherwise, one would wonder why on earth we have so many different methods. One feature of the methods is that they don't all behave in the same way. If you have a number of values significant in both directions, so if, as a very artificial example, we take these four one-tailed p-values, two of the methods, Fisher's and Tippett's method, say reject the null hypothesis because of the two very small ones. But most of the others um, suggest that, in fact, this is neutral as to whether you should reject or, or not and return an overall p-value of 0.5. The maximum p 
method, which isn't very widely used, gives the uh, inverse to the minimum P method, as you might expect. Another way in which we can look at these is what happens if all of the P values you had were equal? What happens for fixed P sub I if we increase K? Well, if it's above a function specific limit, the return value turns tends to zero. If it's below that, then it tends to one. And the picture for the maximum P is the, the we show here the minimum P value, which um, for constant PI rapidly tends to one as K, K gets larger and larger. Um, below it, the logit P and the mean P and some others as well um, show the um, return value being 0 0.5 if the, all the PI are 0 0.5. Uh, if it's above that, then it tends to 1. If below, it tends more or less rapidly to 0. The Fisher is an unusual case in that the, the specific limit is uh, not 0 0.5, it's 0 0.3679 approximately. The mean Z method has the rather strange and undesirable property that for equal P sub I, it always returns either zero or one and never an intermediate value. It also has can have some other rather strange properties. This is because it relies on the standard deviation of the PI to get the significance value. And if they're all very close together, then you're dividing by a very small number and vice versa. Now, Lochin um, can carried out a simulation study. And although he didn't include all of the methods which are in Metope, his suggestion was after you've considered the cancellation issue, because obviously you don't want a method that cancels if that isn't what you wanted to do. And similarly, it, it, you don't want a method that does if, if you don't. Um, he suggests that if the emphasis is to be placed on the very small uh, p-values, then you want to use Fisher's method or Tippett's method. If, you, if your emphasis is on the large p-values, then you want to use Edgington's method or the maximum p method. If you are interested equally in all sizes of p, then you should use Stufa's method or the logit p method. He, in fact, recommends um, overall logit p is probably as good as anything. Now, I mentioned that the package provides some graphics. And this is a plot, a QQ plot, of the data you've seen used in the example earlier. And using a, a, a QQconf CRAM package, um, I use their function for providing a confidence interval about QQ um, plot. And this is a simultaneous confidence interval. If, if any of the points falls outside the ellipse, then you can reject the null. And in this case, it's actually quite hard to see this maybe, but right down in the bottom left-hand corner, there very close to the edge of the ellipse. Are they on it? Are they inside? Are they outside? It's quite hard to tell. However, fortunately, the authors of that package provide another option for plotting the scales on a log scale. The direction of the axes here is reversed, so the small p-values have now gone up into the top right-hand corner. It's now much clearer to see what's happening there. Um, and one of them is um, well outside the QQ plot. The advantage of either of these plots is that you can tell and see where the signal lies in the range of the p-values. Is it the case that all of the p-values are, are tending towards lying outside the confidence ellipse, or, the, uh, or is it just a few? Another plot which um, I provide is the albatross plot, so-called. This plots 
on the y-axis, the transformation of the sample size on the x-axis, tra the transformed p-values. And the contours here show constant effect sizes. In this case, I've chosen standardized mean differences. In this particular example, there are three different sorts of trials being considered here. And they're labeled in the, in the plot A, B, and C. And I think you can see that on the whole, the A's lie rather towards the right-hand side and the C's rather towards the left-hand side. There's some evidence, certainly, that the uh, trials um, are, of, are of different types. This plot's also been suggested by its authors that it may be useful if you have the situation which, which does often arise where in your primary studies, for some of them, you've got effect sizes. And for others, you've only got the p-values. In that case, if you plot all of them and mark the two different sets with different symbols, you can see whether the ones only with p-values are broadly com compatible with the ones where you have the effect sizes. I should say that despite the name that doesn't look to me remotely like any albatross I've ever seen, but that's the name the author gave it. There is stator code available for this, but using um, some advice from him and his blog, I've programmed it in R. So just to wrap up, the albatross plot is suggested by Harrison and colleagues. Um, the methods, the truncated Fisher methods, which I haven't discussed today our wrapper is a wrapper for two functions one from CRAM package T Fisher and another MUTOS there are other packages available for from CRAM I would remark particularly about the pool R package which provides methods for correlated p-values and there are a number of other methods which I haven't covered here but which are available and for details of those, see the CRAN task view on meta-analysis. Citations for everything I've suggested and the data sets <clears throat> and the um, and full documentation are available either in the package manual or in the vignettes. So I'm not going to put them separately in the, in the slide.